Throughout our 40 years at Potential Church, we have been able to meet the needs of a hurting world through missions outreach both locally and globally. As we head into this Christmas season, we will be partnering with several local organizations to bring Christmas compassion to children and families in need. Organizations like His House Children's Home, where we will bring wrapped gifts, a visit from Santa, and milk and cookies to 150 children that would not be able to experience Christmas quite the same without us. We'll be taking our missions team to Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital, where we will bring Christmas compassion, toys, wrapped gifts, and Santa to children who have to spend the holidays in a hospital bed. We're also partnering with the Susan B. Anthony Center, whose mission is to transform families by providing help, hope, and healing for mothers and their children. The team will bring Christmas celebration, special moments, and a gift to put a smile on every child's face. These are just a few of the many organizations that Potential Church will visit this holiday season. For a full list of dates and events, or how you can be a part, visit the Connect station in our lobby. So come along with us as we get an in-depth look at each organization and the volunteer leaders that will bring Christmas compassion to children and families in need this year. to look at a story maybe you've heard the story before how many of you have heard the story of the good samaritan you guys know what i'm talking about when i talk about the good samaritan well several of you and i think because in that story he um jesus gets asked a question that he's often asked um, many times over and i want us to see the context in which the story of the good samaritan is actually given because i think sometimes we misunderstand it it's found in luke chapter 10 all right, Luke chapter 10, and I want us to read verse number 25. Now, if you want the outline, all you have to do is go to our app, Android, iOS. You can download it. Got all the scriptures there and uh, all the, the topics, all that kind of stuff, or you can get a paper one out in the lobby. But in Luke chapter 10, verse 25, it says, and a lawyer. And now understand when you read the word lawyer there, it doesn't mean attorney. Like you and I think about somebody in a courtroom or filing uh, different types of papers. This is an expert in the Old Testament law. Jude, the, the Jews had, you know, these experts because according to Judaism, there are 613 laws in the Torah. And so that's a lot to keep up with. And so this guy was an expert in all of that. So he stands up, which is important because that was a way of showing respect. What do we do today if you're in a classroom and you have a question? What do you do? Right? If you're respectful, you raise your hand. Well, in that day, they would stand up and then he, re, he calls Jesus a teacher. Now it says he stood up to put him to the test, so we really don't know what his motive was, but here's his question. Teacher, what shall I, what's that next word? Do to inherit eternal life. What do I need to do to have eternal life? Or we might say, what do, we, what do I need to do to go to heaven? Or be saved? Or experience salvation? How would you answer that question? Or what did you do if you're a Christ follower? to inherit eternal life. We use a lot of religious words sometimes. You talk to people about that. You know, you talk to them about, are, are, you know, do you have eternal life or are you going to heaven? Have you trusted Christ? Those kind of things. And they'll talk about grace, right? That's a good Bible word. They'll talk about faith, right? You got to have faith and it's through grace. And, and we'll talk about loving Jesus and that Jesus loves me. We use a lot of these different words, but when you talk to people, it looks different. I, I think a lot of times, and many of us maybe, when we really think about how do you inherit eternal life, we think more in terms of a scale. And we tend to think that eternal life is based upon what direction the scale goes. So if I've got more good ornaments, than I do bad ornaments, in the end, I'll be okay. Because when you talk to people about Jesus, they'll often say, they'll talk about church, right? So, so we're trying to, to fill up our basket with good things. So I went to church today. That's, that's a good thing, right? And um, I, I got baptized at one time in my life. So that's another good thing. And when the scale looks like that, you feel pretty good about yourself. You know, I'm a pretty good Christian. <laughs> but there's the other side of the scale, isn't there? Right? Maybe you, um, maybe you told a lie. Right? And it's there. Maybe you came to church 
but you were late. Not talking about anybody specific, but it does happen from time to time. Right? It, it, it's over there. Maybe, um, maybe there's adultery. Now, whoa. And in this situation, we don't feel quite so good. So what do we have to do? We have to do, we have to do more good. And so it's like, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a greatest gift, right, this year. And I'm going to um, I'm gonna read my Bible a little bit more. Whoo. But, but, but life is back and forth. Sometimes it's a little small sin. See, I think most of us, if we're not careful, this is how we judge eternal life. Even as you sit there today, if I were to sit down with you and say, hey, you know, are you going to have eternal life? And if so, why? You might talk about what you've done or what you do. You went on a mission trip. Well, how does Jesus answer this question when it comes to eternal life? Look what he says in verse 26. Jesus loves to answer questions with questions. Verse 26, it says, and he, Jesus, said to him, well, you're an expert in the law. <laughs> how does it read to you? I, you? You know the Old Testament law. What does it say you have to do? And he answers. This young theologian says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's his answer. Now, this is a pretty impressive answer, and the reason being is that these two ideas have never been placed together before in Scripture until this story. See, one's found in Leviticus, and the other is found in the book of Deuteronomy. Remember, there's 613 commandments in the Torah, and he has reduced it to two. Pretty amazing mind he has. Well, how does Jesus respond, right? Love God, love people, basically, is what this dude says. And if you love God and you love people, in the end, it's all going to be, it's all going to weigh out okay. What does Jesus say in verse 28? Is he right? To love God, love people, is that the way to eternal life? Well, what does Jesus say? And Jesus said to him, you have answered, what's the next word? Correctly. And then that two-little word, do this and you will live. Do this and you will live. Now, you read that and you tend to think, well, he must have gotten the right answer. And he did if you're paying attention. Because remember what the question was. The question was, what do I do to have eternal life? Jesus says, you know the law. What do you think? He says, well, I, I need to love God and love people. And I've loved God and I love people. Then I'll be okay in the end. And Jesus says, if you're going to do your way to heaven, you're exactly right. But see, Jesus understood something that's written down for us in the Scripture. And that's the reason he asked the question the way that he did. In James chapter 2 and verse 10, it says this, For the person who keeps all of the laws. So in other words, I mean, you've got all green. It, it looks pretty good. Keeps all of the law. Except what? One is guilty as the person who's broken all of God's law. So what is James saying? James saying is that your life can look like this, right? So it's looking pretty good. I mean, it's all green. You got nothing over here in the red, bad ornament, sin ornament, right? One little one. James says one little one placed over here messes up the whole thing because when you put one over here he says you're what he says you're guilty of all of these so that one little lie that one little lingering look at someone of the opposite sex does what it all of a sudden puts us in a difficult situation See, in Galatians chapter 3 Paul talks about this and this is the reason Paul got into trouble he says, but those who depend upon the law, so you can think of it, those who depend upon the scale, those of us that are here today and think that eternal life or God's blessing in our, is based upon what we do, but those who depend on the law to make them right with God are under a curse. Well, they're trying to do what's right. What, what, a curse? Because the scripture says, cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey, a three-letter word, all the commands that are written in God's book of law. So it's clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. Why? Because we've all broken some part of the law. We've all screwed up. 
The Bible says there is none righteous. There's none right standing. Why? Because we've all sinned. The word sin means to miss the mark. The bullseye of perfection. We all have. And whether it's a small little ornament or a gigantic ornament, whether it's one ornament or a hundred ornaments, we've all screwed up. So that means we can't get there by the scale. And that's what this whole story is about. He says, what must I do? And Jesus says, well, what's the law says? Well, the law says, if I'm going to do my way to heaven, then I have to do it every day, all days, as long as I live. And see, what Jesus understood that you're right if you're going to do your way there. you got to do it all, every day. He says, but that's clear, verse 11. So it's so clear that no one can be right with God by trying to keep the law. Why? For the Scriptures say it is through faith that a righteous, the word righteous means right standing, that a, the righteous person has life. But Christ rescued us from this, this up and down, this trying to do our way to heaven. Christ rescued us from the curse and pronounced by the law. You know what the law is there for? To remind us of our guilt. When he was, how did he do it? When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself our curse, our sin. For it is written in the scripture, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Now, this young theologian is not finished. He knows he's kind of talked his way into a corner here. Jesus says, okay, you, you know, what's it say? Love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, you're right. If you're going to do your way into heaven, that's what you got to do. And so the young theologian knows that the way we treat others reveals what our relationship with God is like. In other words, it's impossible to love God and not love people. Okay, and so he asks the question, if you look in your outline, by wishing to justify himself, find a loophole here, he says, well, who's my neighbor? Maybe I can do the scale thing, depending on who my neighbor is. I mean, if my neighbor is just the, the rest of the, the Jewish folks, and I, I can probably do this thing, and, and in the end, I'll do my way into heaven. I'll, the scale will work out in my favor. It'll all be okay, so, so who, who, who's my neighbor? And then we get the story that some of us might be familiar with. Verse 30, Jesus replied and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now you need to know that Jerusalem is like 3,500 feet in elevation above Jericho. So it was a pretty steep decline. It was about 17 to 18 miles. And it had a lot of blind curves. And as a result, there was a lot of robbery that happened, a lot of death. It was known as the blood road because it was very dangerous between Jerusalem and Jericho. And so Jesus starts his story out with a dude that's going from Jerusalem down to Jericho. And it says he fell among robbers. They stripped him. They beat him. And he went away leaving him half dead. Well, how do you be half dead? That simply means he was unconscious, okay? Verse 31, and by chance... A priest was going down on the road. Now, that's important. It says he was going down. Now, remember, what a priest would do is that for a week, at least twice a year, they would serve in the temple. They would do their duties in the temple. But priests didn't live in Jerusalem. They normally lived in surrounding communities. So this priest has served his week in the temple with God. You might say he's been to church. And now he's on his way home when he sees this dude, okay? Kind of like you and I, in just a few moments, you're going to be on your way home from church. Worshiping God, telling God how much you love him, telling God how much you care about him. So it says, and by chance, a priest was on his way home, and when he saw him, he what? <laughs> he passed by on the other side. That's so easy to do, isn't it? You ever do that? Pretend you don't see something because you don't want to deal with it? In just a moment, you're going to be on your way home. You may pass somebody on the side of the road that's holding a sign that says they're hungry. You ever get in the other lane so that you don't have to deal with that? And before we get real judgmental about this religious person, what about you and me as religious people? He saw it, but he pretended as he didn't, and he moved over to the other side. Verse 32, likewise a Levite. Now, a Levite was like an associate pastor. It was an assistant to the priest. It says, and when he came to the place, so he didn't just you know, walked to the other side, he first walked over and saw the situation. To me, that says he wrestled with it a little bit. And when the Levite, or likewise, Levite also, when he came to the place, he saw him, but he too passed by on the other side. Now, at this moment, the crowd is wondering, who's the hero going to be? 
right? I mean, they thought it was going to be the priest. He's been in the temple. He's been with God. He sang. He's given. He's preached. I mean, he's done all these things, and he's on his way home. And, of course, he would be the one to help out someone in need, but he's not. Well, maybe, maybe Jesus is trying to remind us that everybody's important, and, and so it's going to be the assistant, but he doesn't either. Then in verse 33, but a Samaritan. Now, the problem with that is that the Jews and the Samaritans hated one another. They saw the Samaritans as half-bloods, and the reason they did is because if you know your history, you know that Israel was divided into two kingdoms. You had the northern and the southern. The northern was known as Israel. The southern was known as Judah. And Israel fell, the northern kingdom, before Judah did to Assyria. And so Assyria took them captive, and then Babylonians, the Babylonians came in and took them captive, and they also sent different nations into the northern tribe, and they intermarried. And when they intermarried, they were no longer full-blooded Jews. If you remember when we studied the book of Nehemiah, and the Jews went back to Jerusalem after being captive by the, the Babylonians to rebuild the wall, and the Samaritans were like, we want to help. And what did the Jews say? Uh-uh, you're not a real Jew. You, you can't help us in this. And so these, these two groups, the Samaritans had their own temple, their own type of worship. They just didn't like one another. They hated one another. They despised uh, one another. Of course, the Samaritans, because they wouldn't um, allow them in, and the Jews, because they felt that they, had been, uh, they hadn't been committed and that they had intermarried. But a Samaritan who was on a journey, so he was going somewhere. He had somewhere to be, came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt what? Compassion. That's what this whole series has been about. And remember, compassion is not just seeing a need, it's acting upon that. And he came to him and he bandaged up his wounds. Now, when you read that, you can just pass by it, but think for a moment. How did he do that? I mean, was he carrying bandages? I mean, do you carry bandages just in case you come up on somebody's bleeding? Right before you come to church where you're like, honey, don't forget the bandages. You never know. I know. The way in which he did this is he used his, his own clothing. To, to tear it and to, to become uh, bandages for him. It says he put uh, bandages on him. He poured oil and wine, which was like an antiseptic. It was the medicine of the day. Put him on his own beast, brought him to the inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii. Now, this is a, quite a bit of money. This is a, one denarii was a one day's work. So this is two days of full labor. He had to work two days to get those two coins. And he gave it to the innkeeper and he said, take care of him and whatever more you spend when I return, I will repay you. So he gives him what's owed to him, but he also says, I'll give you more if it's needed. It's kind of like this is like his greatest gift, you might say, you know? It, it's the extra. It's the above. And then Jesus asked this question. Which of these three do you think proved to be the neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And this Jewish expert in the law couldn't even say the word Samaritan. Look what he says. And he said, the one who showed what? Mercy toward him. He didn't say the Samaritan. He said, the one who showed mercy toward him. Then Jesus said to him, you go and do the same. Now, this story that Jesus tells within its context, I think Jesus is teaching us two things. The first thing that he's teaching us is the primary purpose for the reason Jesus told this story. And it is simply this. It wasn't the guy in the ditch it wasn't what the guy in the ditch did that saved him. It was the mercy of the Samaritan. See, because in this story, who is the ultimate Samaritan? It is Jesus, of course. Right? The guy in the ditch didn't wave his hand and say, can you help me? Oh, no, no, he was unconscious. He's half dead. The Samaritan didn't go over and say, now, are you Republican or Democrat? <laughs> I... He didn't say, now do you go to the Baptist church or the Methodist church, right? He, he, it wasn't, there wasn't anything about the guy in the ditch that moved the Samaritan to do something about it. It was the mercy of the Samaritan. That's what Jesus said. He said, now you go do that. Why? Because that's what Jesus has done for you and I, right? It's not the scale that moved Jesus to the cross, it's not because you're at church today. It's not because you put some money in the basket or you're good to your kids. No, the primary thing that Jesus is trying to teach in the story of the Good Samaritan is it has nothing to do with what we do. Eternity has nothing to do with what we do. It's not dependent upon what we do. 
It's all dependent upon his mercy. That's the primary reason Jesus tells this story. It's nothing to do with the scales. Nothing to do with the scales. I'm telling you, there are religions and churches. This is salvation. You do enough good, and in the end, you'll be okay. And your good can somehow make up for your bad. And I want you to know that there's nowhere in Scripture that that is taught, and instead, just the opposite here. But there's a second thing that Jesus is teaching, is that our compassion, our being a good Samaritan, comes from a heart that has received compassion. In other words, why do we then give? Why do we then serve the needy? Why then do we come to worship together and serve one another? It's because that compassion is not in order to receive something, but because we have received something. You could think of it like this. We respond to God's love. In other words, why do we love God? Because he first loved us. Nobody here loved God first. You didn't go looking for God. He came looking for you and me. So we are responding to his love. But the second thing that he's teaching us is we initiate love or compassion to others. In other words, while we respond to God's love, I'm not walking around saying, I love you if you love me. I'll serve you if you serve me. I'll be kind to you if you're kind to me. If if your scale weighs, weighs out good, then no, no. Why in the world do we serve one another, give to one another, help one another? Because it's in response to him. Paul says this, you want to know why why I do what I do? The love of Christ compels me. That's challenging. See, when you think about it, the scripture has all kinds of places where it talks about this. Luke, same book of the Bible, Luke chapter 6, look what it says. If you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. Verse 33, and if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners, remember the word sinners kind of makes us recoil sometimes, but the word just simply means the imperfect, those who have missed the bullseye of perfection. Why should you get credit? Even sinners will do that much. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners will lend to other sinners for a full return. Instead, verse 35, love your enemies, do good to them, lend to them without expecting to get repaid. And when your reward from heaven and your reward from heaven will be very great. Now, hear what that scripture is saying. Heaven is not a reward. There are rewards in heaven, but heaven's not a reward. Heaven's a result of God's mercy. You didn't earn heaven. You don't get a reward of heaven for being good. It is the result of God's mercy. But there are rewards because he goes on and he says in heaven, he says, and you will truly be acting as children of the most high. How do you and I act as children of the most high? We love our enemies. We, We give to those who can't give back. So if you and I are doing just the opposite. See, I believe that there may be some of us here, and you know why you're at church today? Because you're hoping to get more on this side so God will bless you. Right? You're, you're applying for a loan next week. Or there's a, a dude or d- dudeette, dudeette, lady, you know. I don't know what's the right thing, but um, you're hoping they'll say yes. You're about to ask them out. That's why you're here. You're here to get points. You're, you're here trying to put more green ornaments on your basket. but it doesn't work. That's that's not very motivating. Those folks aren't very faithful to church. They only come when they have a need in hopes that somehow they can get the basket in their favor so they can get from God what it is they need. But that's that's not, then you'll truly be acting like children of the most high. That's That's not loving our enemy. Why? He says, for he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. You you must be compassionate just as your father is compassionate. Do not judge others or you will be judged. Do not condemn others. It'll come back against you. Forgive others and they'll do what? They'll forgive you. And then he goes into this text, which is pretty interesting. He says, give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more. Now, that's interesting. You think about it. If you like ice and you want to get more ice in your glass, what do you do? You shake the cup. To do what? To, to, so it'll form together to make more room. Well, that's exactly what he's saying here. Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more. But that's not, and then it's running over and poured into our lap. The amount you give will determine the amount 
that you get back. So what did the Good Samaritan give? If he gave in response to God's love, what did he give? Well, remember, it's not enough to see a need. That's not compassion, right? You can see a need and keep going. You can see a need from the window of your car. People do that all the time. What do people who see, only see a need do? Well, they call their congressperson. They write a blog, tell the pastor, Just, we need to do something about that. You hear that at work? We should do something like, somebody ought to do something about that. Somebody ought to help them. I don't know why. They got all the money in the world. Like, they're over here doing this. Why don't they? That's not compassion. All three of these guys saw. Look what it says in verse 31. And the priest was going down on the road, and he saw him. Saw the need, didn't do anything about it. The Levite, verse 32. And also, when he came to the place, he saw the need, he saw him. It's only in verse 33, the good Samaritan, when he saw him, he felt compassion. And the word compassion literally means you feel it and then you do something. Isn't it easy to pass it by? I mean, isn't it easy to be in your car and see a need and think to yourself, somebody ought to do something about that and just keep going? In your community, see a need in your family? Why, why, why don't we meet the need? Why not pull over or why not give a little resources to the guy holding the sign? Because he hadn't earned it. Doesn't deserve his scale. It doesn't, you know. I uh, I got a letter the other day, uh, it was October the twelfth, and it, it, the letter kind of begins and says, that, you know, we've been part of Potential Church for about twenty years, and uh, and and love it. And then she says that um, her and her coworker talk about their it says talk about their churches all the time. So she's a strong Christian talk, and says where she goes to church. It's in Oak, uh, Apollo, Apollo, Apollo. Thank you. <laughs> the more services I do, the crazier my mind gets. Okay, so it says, um, today she shared with me that her church is struggling financially and that the pastor does not have a salary and often puts money into the church out of his own pocket to pay the bills. Due to the location and the poverty level, many of the 30 members are not tithing. As a result, the pastor has asked his congregation to help come up with fundraising to help their church make ends meet. And she says, um, I know that our church has been very faithful in helping other churches. And um, do you feel that our church would be able to help? And uh, I'm sure anything would help. So I remember when I, I got this letter and, and I, you know, I, I open it up and the first thought I have is, well, you know, it's pretty cool. Somebody's been a part of Potential now for 20 years. That's, that's incredible. That's incredible commitment. And, then I'm, and, I, and I'm, I'm reading through it and it says, um, um, many of the 30 church members are not tithing. And I thought, well, many of ours aren't either, you know. The average is like 3%, three out of every 100. Um, and I think I'm maybe the Levi on here. I, I, I looked back through it, felt some of it, but really as I read about their struggles, I couldn't help but think about my own and the financial challenge, that, the potential, that just more zeros, but same stress, same weight. Do we do this or do we do that? Can we do that? Can we do this? And so I put it down and, um, and, and, and went on. A few days later, I picked it, I picked it back up, you know, and kind of read it again. And it's not because, you know, I'm a super spiritual person. It's because his love compels us. And so we called the pastor and, and, and um, different ones on the team talked to the pastor to see what, what we could do and um, end up sending them um, $500. Not a lot of money, but it is enough money in the sense that it makes a difference for them and it makes a difference in, in not, here in what we can do and what we, what, we, what we can't do. And you can't do everything for everybody but that's not an excuse for not doing anything. It's so easy to pass by, right? We, we get asked stuff all the time. You get asked stuff all the time. And just to easily put, just pass it by, pretend that I didn't get it. Did you get that letter, Pastor? What letter? <laughs> what letter? 
but the love of Christ compels us. So it's not just seeing somebody ought to do something about this. Those people go to that church. No, no. It doesn't matter what they ought to do. It's what should I do. Right? Somebody else's failure doesn't discount my responsibility. So what did the Samaritan give? Right? That's, a, that's the question here. You think, okay, Jesus is trying to teach us something here. What did the Samaritan give? So let's walk through these real quickly, all right? The first thing, because I think we can learn from this, is the Samaritan gives up his time. Remember, he, he was on his way, not on his way home, right? I, the priest, I think, you know, he'd done his week. He's like, man, I got to get home. Wife's got brownies in the oven. And it, it's, it's, but this guy was on a business trip. I mean, he, it says he's on a journey, so he's got a place to be at a certain time to be there. But in order to be a good Samaritan, what does he have to do? First of all, he has to go to a, out of his way. It doesn't say, and he took him with him to his hotel. It says it took him to a hotel or an inn. So he took him somewhere he wasn't planning to go. That takes time. And then he stayed an extra night. Again, that's time. It's going to impact when he's going to get there and how he's going um, to get there. Compassion takes time, doesn't it? I've discovered that compassion tends to interrupt our plans. Why would you do that? Why would we give up time? Because that's what Jesus did for us. Because ultimately, he is the good Samaritan. And then we are to model ourselves after him. In John chapter 1, look at what it says. It says that he, God, came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. Then he came to his own people, and they, the Jews, they rejected him. So the word, and here in John 1, the word means God, means Jesus. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. So God puts on skin, and he comes to planet Earth, and he makes his home among us. You know what that is? That's time. The creator of the universe gave you and me his time. He walked on planet Earth. He grew up, in a sense, in his humanity on planet Earth. And here's what I wrote in my journal. Our response didn't change the time he gave us. What does it say? We rejected him. We didn't respect him. We didn't welcome him. But it's not like God said, well, if you're going to reject me, I'm out of here. Too bad, so sad. That's not what it says. Our response didn't have anything to do with his commitment. And that's the same thing that happens when we have experienced the love of Christ. We serve not because those that we're serving deserve our service. We serve because God served us. He came to planet Earth and he was nailed to a tree, not because we had earned it and not because we deserve it, but because of his mercy. And so whether we go to his house or whether we go to the homeless or whether we go to those who are addicted and struggling, it's got nothing to do with what they deserve. It is the love of Christ that compels us. That's what compassion is. It's time giving of our time and if you're going to have a compassionate Christmas it's going to take some time it takes time to go to his house it takes time to go out and buy a toy bring it. it takes time to be a part of his the worship service take time to be faithful to invite a friend to write a card to make a phone call to do a visit to go next door. All those things take time. But that's what he did for us. And that's why we do it for others. But the Samaritan also gave his comfort. He gives up his comfort. Remember, the guy's unconscious. He's bleeding. He's half naked. He bandages him with his own clothing, puts wine, his own wine and oil, and then puts him on his own donkey. Now, if the dude that was injured is on the donkey, where's the good Samaritan? He's walking beside him. That's uncomfortable. You know why, how I know that? Is why did he bring the donkey? He didn't bring the donkey to walk beside it. He brought the donkey to ride it. But he was willing to become uncomfortable. Why? Because the dude in the ditch deserved it? Nowhere in the scripture will you find that. Why did he do it? Because of the love of Christ. Because what Jesus did for us. He was willing to become uncomfortable. Look what it says in Philippians chapter 2. It says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others better than yourself. Don't look out for your own, only for your own interest, but take the interest of others too. And here it is. Here's what I want you to see. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. What was his attitude? Although he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. 
Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God, even to dying the death of a criminal on the cross. And I'll just tell you, the cross is uncomfortable. And yet, because he was uncomfortable for us, we what? Then we are uncomfortable. We are initiating the uncomfortableness. That's what compassion really is. And see, this won't cause you to be compassionate. Why? Why in the world would God bless you? Because you're good. So who are you going to bless? The good people. The people who in your life have the scale in the right direction. But that's not what the Bible calls compassion. It doesn't talk about those who deserve compassion. Instead, the scripture says, because we have received compassion, we then give compassion. And uncomfortableness takes the form of many different things, doesn't it? And you have the huge aspect of going to the cross, but you also have the uncomfortableness of, oh, I don't know, serving people that you don't know, serving with people. I'm a shy person. Okay, I'm the guy that grew up in, in school and was afraid to raise my hand. I, I just I was shy. Now, as a pastor, if I'm going to help people, I have to initiate. I can't just wait for people to say, help me, help me. You have to initiate. You have to step into people's lives. That's uncomfortable for me. And yet, the reason we are to do whatever is uncomfortable is not because of our love for others. Our love for others comes because he first loved us. So see, the scripture is helping us understand. You know why some of us are so selfish? It's because you got religion. And religion, it's earned its way. And when you look around in the world, what do you see? You see a bunch of people that have yet to earn you what you earned something from you. They don't deserve your time. You work hard. And if they worked hard, they'd have what you have. That's not compassion. Nowhere in here does it talk about how this guy deserved the Samaritan's compassion. And nowhere in Scripture will you find it saying that you and I deserve what God has done for us. It's his love for us that caused us to initiate that same love for other people. You know, I was thinking, we often think of church. And sometimes I'll talk to folks and they'll say, you know, we come to potential and it just it meets our need. But really, that's, we get it screwed up, don't we? Really, we're not supposed to be here because the church meets our need. We're supposed to be here to meet the needs of others. And in meeting the needs of others, what does God supernaturally do in our own lives? He meets our need. So he gives his time. He gives his comfort. And then lastly, he gives up his resources. Right? Two days wages. That's a lot of money. I mean, this is, must have been a, a ritz. It wasn't a day's in or something. Right? I mean, think, he doesn't know this dude. Wouldn't it be easy to look at this dude and say, you know what? I, I can't, I mean, it, I, I be, I'll pour a little wine, you know, disinfect his sword. I'm not taking him to a hotel. He knew what this road was like. He's probably drunk on this road. That's probably the reason he got beat up. If he'd been paying attention, this wouldn't have happened to him. Right? There'd be a lot of reasons why in the world you wouldn't give two days wages to help this guy get better, plus whatever else it takes to get him back on the road. In other words, I'm on a, a work trip in order to make money, take care of myself and my family, and on the very trip that I'm going in order to make the research, I'm not going to give to somebody I've discovered upon the trip. Now, before you say, well, he's on a business trip, he's probably a rich business person. And if I were a rich business person, I'd help a lot of people too. I mean, if I had money like so-and-so, if I drove a certain car, if I lived in a certain, I mean, I'd, I'd give a bunch of money too, but you need to know that that is in the opposite direction of reality. Wealth has a negative effect on people's generosity. Think about it. America is the most generous nation in the world. And America is more wealthy today than it's ever been. I'm not talking about you and me. I'm just talking about as a country. We have more wealth within our borders than we've ever had. But our generosity is going in the opposite direction. Wealth's going one way, generosity's going another. You know what? That's true individually too, so it shouldn't surprise us. Do you know the more money somebody makes, the less percentage of resources they give away? 
So before we discount this and just say, well, if I was wealthy, I'd be this generous person. I'd help, you know, this person. I'd help. No, no, listen, understand. If you don't do it who you are today and where you are today, it wouldn't matter if God dropped a million dollars in your bank account tomorrow. You'd be just as selfish with it as you are with your $10. That's what the Bible teaches. So you're lying to yourself, okay? It's easy for us to do, but the Bible wants us to be um, God's words like this, it afflicts the comfortable, right? But it brings comfort to the afflicted. So there's this tension within the text. Compassion has a cost. It has a cost. How quickly do we dismiss our responsibility to initiate? Simply because I don't have time. I, 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 that's going to be so uncomfortable. I'm going to have to get up early. I'm going to have to do this. I have to, oh, I'm going to have to go there. Oh, it's, just, it's just uncomfortable. I, just, I can't do that. Oh, I, oh, there they are. They, they're asking for money again. I, I, just, I just don't want to give it. Our compassion is a result of what we see. And what we see is determined by who we are. That's a scary thought. Our compassion is the result of what we see and what we see is determined by who we are. I, I got a, a buddy who's like a mentor to me. He's a farmer, a rice farmer in Walcott, Arkansas. You ever been to Walcott, Arkansas? Only 113 people that live there, but you never know. He's a rice farmer. And if you get in the car, we get, I'd go with him to different places. And as he's driving down Highway 49, has rice fields on both sides, speed limits like, I can't remember, 55, 60, he drives 25. And the reason he does is because he's a farmer. He's looking at the tractors. He's like, hey, that's an international tractor over there. That's a John Deere tractor over there. Oh, look at that rice levy. It's not going to last. Oh, he's got a pump. And, and you, you know what? When I drive through farm field, you know, farm fields, I, I drive fast. I, I don't care. I don't care if it's a John Wayne tractor or a John Deere tractor. I mean, I, I, I don't care if it's red or if it's green. I don't care if the levee's going to last. I mean, you know, I'm not even a big fan of rice at the end of the day. I, I just... But now if you drive with me, we're going to slow down at every church and say, what's going on? Why? Because I'm a pastor. If you ride, if you ride with a uh, police officer, what are you going to? You're going to see criminals everywhere you go, right? Because you ride with a thief, what are you going to see? Marks. That door's unlocked. You notice that? You know, that, oh, that wallet's sticking out of their pocket there. You're not even going to notice it, but they are. Why? Because they're a thief. Who we are determines what we see, and what we see determines what we do. Now, that is convicting. Why? Because it tells us that what we see reveals who you are. What do you see in your neighborhood? What do you see in our community? When you come to church, what, 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 what do you see? Do you see those opportunities to give your time, give your comfort, give your resources? It's challenging. So as I was reading this story, I wanted to end with these two questions. Here's the first one, because it's the two things that he's trying to teach us. One is, have you inherited eternal life? I'm not asking if you've been baptized, because that has nothing to do with eternal life. I'm not asking you if you're a member of any church. It has nothing to do with it. I'm not asking you if you can quote scriptures. It has nothing to do with it. Eternal life is not based at all upon how many green ornaments you have in your basket. It's based upon one thing. For whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's a surrenderance to him. It's admitting that you can't do anything to earn it. And that you have to completely sit down. You have to completely trust him. Have you inher inherited eternal life? And then here's the second question. Who's your neighbor? Who's going to be your neighbor this Christmas? Going to be like every other Christmas? Or are you going to see things with fresh eyes? Is it going to take more time? Yeah. Going to cost you more money? Sure is. Is it going to take some of your, oh yeah, oh yeah. Well, why in the world would I do it? Because his love compels you. Not because you feel guilty, but because maybe for the first time in your life, you really begin to understand just what it is he did for you. Would you bow your head? 
If you've never trusted Christ, I want to invite you to do that right where you're sitting. There's nothing you have to do. You just have to ask in faith. What is faith? Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It's believing that God can and will do what in his word he said he would do. Which is if you trust him, put your faith, pistuo is the Greek word, which means to rest in him. Admit you can't, but you're going to trust him. You're going to surrender to him. Just tell him right there where you're sitting, God, forgive me for trying to do this thing my own way, I, trying to, to be good enough or be religious enough. None of that has really changed me. Oh, I'm a good person for a while. I got some green ornaments in my basket. But at the end of the day, I know something's not right. And I am committing to you. The Bible says that when we pray a prayer like that with a surrendered heart, that God does what we ask him to. And then secondly, are you willing to be a neighbor? A neighbor to serve, to help, to be uncomfortable, to give. Father, I, I thank you for the story of the Good Samaritan. I thank you for the story of Christmas, the, the beginning, the originating of the ultimate Samaritan. And that what you have done for us, you call us to do for others. Help us to do that this Christmas. And may this Christmas truly be, not just on the title of a teaching, but in all of our hearts, may it truly be a compassionate Christmas for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, thank you guys.